ladies and gentlemen. The Kids in the Room Podcast. The Kids in the Room Podcast. That's right. That's right. Brought to you by Moo Faces TV. Woo! All right, all right, all right, all right. Hey, guys. Welcome to the Kids in the Room Podcast. Woo! All right. Today, we've got Steven Liberman on the actual podcast today. Steven, what's going on? What's up, Erez? Appreciate you having me on, brother. Yeah, man. Yeah, so, you know, tell us, tell, tell the audience, tell the audience what you do. What is your magic A little thing? bit. Yeah. About what I do. Yeah, a little bit. Well, let's focus on the things that they might be interested in. So, first is I own a real estate private equity firm that buys self-storage facilities and multifamily apartment complexes. Um, so, we own just about $150 million worth of property. We're under contract for another $55 million or so. Um, so that's what we are currently doing where we came from. We'll get into a little bit of that during the, during the show, but it's, uh, it's been a fun ride so far. You know, we basically have been looking for ways to get out of the volatility of wall street and build consistent passive income and pay less taxes. And this is the best way to do it. Wow. That's crazy. So how, how does that done? Like, how did you get into this? Give us a background. Like, what made you Steven Yeah, so I started I started as a real estate agent back in 2000 and oh man, dating myself now. It's got to be 15 years ago. So yeah, like 2006, 7 and I started being a realtor to help other people find other investment properties, right? So mm-hmm. as I started doing that um I was making a lot of other people a lot of money, right? I was going out and I was finding great deals for them. And then I was going to um, sell them on the open market. And after I did that for a couple of years, I recognized like, man, you know, I think I could do this myself. Right. Right. Like how do I find these great deals and then just give them away? Right. So then we got into wholesaling and, and fix and flip on the residential side. And after flipping about a thousand houses, right, the next epiphany was, you know, I think we're paying too much in taxes. I wonder how I can avoid getting killed in taxes and paying half of what we make through the business to Uncle Sam. Right. How did right? you do it? And and it was also very transactional, right? And very highly taxed. So like every time you flip a house, it's great. You make some money, but then you have to go find another house and do it all over again. So in terms of transactionality versus passive and repetitive income, flipping game is all transactional. There's like, it, you don't have a house that pays you twice. So we started looking into more passive income type properties and got around some other guys that were doing some large deals. And they said, oh, you should definitely go into apartment buildings. And I said, all right, well, that's interesting. But why would I want to do that? Right. Like, so we did, we bought a 66 unit uh, apartment complex and then we built three self storage facilities. And that year we paid zero in taxes and the light bulb really went off. Right. We, we figured out that we could create passive income consistently monthly and pay less in taxes legally because the IRS tax code has these kind of carve outs for real estate investors. So we pivoted about three and a half years ago. And then, like I said, in the beginning, just kind of one hundred and fifty million dollars under management so far. We'll be at two fifty by probably the end of the year. We'll be at a billion and uh, probably for the next thirty six months. Awesome. So I got some quick questions. Um, I definitely want, I think, you know, when we're talking about this, you, you, I just want to backtrack for a second. You actually mentioned that, uh, you had, um, you had brought, um, that you went into a uh, real estate investment different than what you were doing priorly, which was flipping houses. Could you explain what that variance is? Yeah. So, well, so I, I consider flipping, uh, still an investment, but you know, I, <laughs> As you grow, right, I think that you, you, at least for me, I looked at investments as something that would pay me. I looked at jobs as something that I trade time for money for. So when, when I was a realtor, I was trading time for money, right, and working on commissions. And then making the switch to wholesaling and fixing and flipping, I became a business owner, but I was still involved in the day-to-day working full-time, right? So I still created a job. And now we passively invest, and as an investor first, I don't have to deal with the tenants and toilets and roof leaks and all of those things, right? My money is just working for me and our investors that invest alongside of us, their money is just working for us. We get quarterly checks in the mail. We get K1s at the end of the year. 
we see some photos and videos and monthly updates, but I'm not trading the time for the money like I was with the job. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. So, so basically you're saying that you make more money doing the actual investment than what you were doing previously, just flipping the houses. Yeah. Well, immediately, if I was just earning the same dollar for dollar, I was paying 40% less in taxes immediately. So, you know, that instantly poured gasoline on the income. And how did that happen right? again? How did you actually get around paying the 40% less or more or less taxes, for, for example? Yeah. So it's not just how I got around it, right? It's how every commercial real estate investor in the country gets around it. And it's because you own a piece of a building that depreciates over time. The IRS tax code has depreciation benefits for these buildings built into the tax code. Your listeners, if they're interested in this, should read a book called Tax-Free Wealth by Tom Wheelwright. He's uh, Robert Kiyosaki's CPA, and he teaches CPAs around the country how to do this legally because the tax code has incentives for property owners built into it. So at the end of the year, we get a K-1 instead of a 1099 from these buildings, right? And a K-1 is a partnership return that shows what you've made off of the property, right? So my investment income will come, you know, that's usually at a capital gains rate. So not even ordinary income rates, it's long-term capital gains, which is a lower tax rate to start. And then you have depreciation and, you know, like this, let's use this $42 million deal. I just bought 384 units in Daytona beach. It was a $42 million project. We're going to have $10 million in write-offs to distribute between us and our investors in this project in year one. Right. right? So when you get $10 million in losses as a K-1, you don't have to pay taxes. Right. So, I mean, all right, makes sense. Totally makes sense. So now that you're at this point to where, you know, um, you start doing the real estate investment and things like that, um, what was the qualifications of you originally getting in? Were you automatically an accredited investor or was that even a need? So because we were the owners and the operators, right, we are accredited by nature of being an operator. So what's interesting is if you start a fund, you're you're automatically accredited whether or not you hit the financial barometers or not. Really? You know, so we did happen to be uh, accredited when we started investing passively because flipping a thousand houses should get you there. Um, but our so our fund, the mix of the investors in our fund are both accredited and non-accredited or what they call sophisticated. So there's some rules as to how you can advertise and things like that around who is allowed in, right? So I just tell everybody, just go to the website, sign up. We'll get on a phone call and figure out what you are. But for us, we were already accredited. And now we have probably a 70-30 mix of accredited versus non-accredited investors with us. Wow. And so you can actually add into this real estate investment non-accredited investors. Correct. They just can't publicly advertise for them. So the SEC's rules are really around advertising, not around who's capable of investing. So I'm not allowed to go on this show and say, hey, guys, I have this deal. This is the return structure. This is how much you're going to make potentially that I can't do and take anybody in right now. If I was just accepting accredited investors I could do that. So what we need to do is we need to create what they call a substantive business relationship, right? We need to go down the road. We need to understand your financials. We need to understand what your sophistication level is, and we need to build a personal relationship. Like I can't just have this conversation with you and then give you a deal the next day, 30, 60, 90 days content and quality of the relationship is looked at by the sec and says, is this a real substantive business relationship? Or are you trying to get around sec guidelines? Right. And how do you prove that? I mean, we have systems and processes around it, right? Like, so when you go and sign up for our investor club, everything is tracked through our CRM, every email, every text, every conversation. Uh, we fill out forms and questionnaires and figure out exactly, you know, you don't want to take somebody's last 30 grand, right? Like you want to make sure that they have money to invest where it's not their last dollar. They're not going to miss a mortgage payment for it. Like you, you need to understand the investor's financial picture before you and decide whether or not they should invest with you. Right. I mean, it, it's very interesting, really interesting. But, you know, you always wonder, like, you know, you hear these stories about, you know, early, uh, you know, now tech investors who became, you know, these uh, major tech investors who literally used their credit cards um, previously to invest into startups like Twitter and things like that. 
and you know they didn't have the money they were college students and things like that and they they used their credit cards and it's like well how the hell did they do that you know they didn't really have the money yeah they did cash advances to get into twitter (laughs) i mean pretty much i mean if you use your if you if you max out your credit cards you're still a college student or roughly just out of it and then you just max out your credit cards i mean did you have the money no, you didn't. Right. Right. So it's like, but how the hell do they? I get mean, look, that's that's, crazy. that's taking a real huge risk, right? I mean, most companies don't end up being Twitter, but you know, there's some real estate crowdfunding sites too that that allow this, right? Like you can get in for five hundred bucks and get into a real estate investment. So there's there's all different ways to kind of invest, right? The people that usually invest with us are looking for long-term experience, more passivity, like operators that have track records and things like that. And they like the personal feel, right? They like the personal connection. And, you know, we have a investor portal. You can log in and kind of get updates and kind of connect with us and see what the team is doing. You know, so it's, um, it's very interactive. I feel like people invest in real estate for the same reason that I do. They like to touch it, feel it, be a part of the deal. And we do our best to keep people up to date on what's going on with the assets that their money's in. Right. Totally. Makes sense. So like, you know, like at, at what point are you, or do you feel like you, cause you said also we, so is there, is there a bigger team or do you go in with a group of people? Like how does this, all, how, how does this work out for you? Yeah. So you don't buy a $50 million building by yourself to start at least. Um, <laughs> So yeah, many hands might light work. I mean, when I say we, I mean us and our investors, right? We have limited partners. I have a business partner who we started the, the business with 12 years ago, but I look at everybody as a partner, right? I mean, people write me a $250,000 check so that I can go invest their money into one of our assets. They're a partner in the deal. They even get a K1 partnership return, right? So uh, yeah, in this space, in what they call real estate syndication is just that you're, you're divvying up roles and responsibilities and like, you know, so we're the capital side. We really just deal with the money, right? We're underwriting the deals and we're managing the managers, but the majority of what we do is manage capital, but you have boots on the ground there. I mean, you know, this last project, we have seven full-time employees that stay on site there, right? But I'm not there. So yeah, it's definitely a team sport. Right. Oh man. So you, you gathered up your team. How, how did you connect with your team and find your team members? Like, were you just like through friends or you went through a, some investment network or? Yeah. So my, my, my business partner, actually, we met because he trained my dog 11 years ago or 12 years ago. And uh, so he, he, he ends up training my dog. And at the end of it, I'm still a realtor at that point. And he's doing like construction. And we started chatting and uh found out that we both like real estate, decided to write a business plan and start that wholesale flip business. And then, uh, you know, once we pivoted into the commercial multifamily space, we just looked for people that were smarter than us, right? If there's any piece of business advice, right, that I could come, that we can give to um, future millionaires, it, it would be go find people smarter than you and replicate what they've done. It's uh, so, we, you know, our partner in, in the multifamily side has a billion dollars of assets under management. They have 40 years experience. This guy's been in business longer than I've been alive, you know? So we found these guys, we created value for them. We said, we would like to fund some of these deals. And then they said, okay, great. Let's partner on these deals. Right. So now we're partnered with, you know, institutional guys that do the day-to-day operations. And, you know, we, we focus on the people and the investors and the donor advised fund, which is how we give back, right? So we have a donor advised fund that we carve out a percentage of uh, all of our corporate income that goes into this donor advised fund. And we, we basically fund many charities around the world. And that's kind of the heart and the reason behind the business. Um, and that way we can stay in our lane. Those guys stay in their lane, but we're partners. Right. So wait a minute. You said that the heart of your business is charity. Could you explain that? Like what, what's going on there? <laughs> Yeah. Well, so our tagline is invest with purpose and, you know, we're, we're big into, there's no shortage of need in the world. Right. And, um, I think that in this business, a lot of capital gets created and, um, it's kind of our responsibility to be able to give back, you know, so we have, you know, in the past, I don't know, 45 days or so we've, um, 
funded 22,000 uh, survival bags for um, Thai, for a Thai family's missionary. They, they'll feed 22,000 families for five days uh, each, each one of these bags. Um, we've dug a well in Kenya that will provide water for 1,200 people that didn't have clean drinking water. Um, so there's just, there's a lot of opportunity to give money away. There's no shortage of need in the world. And, you know, these, these deals create a lot of passive income and it's very difficult for, uh, ministries and nonprofits to consistently raise money, right? So they have to leave the mission field to come home and talk to guys like me and you and say, Hey, you know, can you sponsor me for a hundred bucks a month while I'm doing X? Right. So, you know, our plan is to be able to create enough passive income through those uh, nonprofits where they don't have to actually leave their field. And when they come home, they should be leaving their field to recharge. Right. They shouldn't be coming home to capital raise. So we think, you know, this business is a great opportunity for us to create passive income for our families, for our investors and for these nonprofits. Right. That's exactly where it was. Yeah. And so. You, you do these to uh, a assorted amount of charities and, you know, basically because these charities don't have um, – it's hard for them to actually raise funding and also go on their missions or, or do what they need to do as far as, like, giving back, like, with any type of philanthropy or, or cause. Yeah, I mean, what, what, what came up with this idea was literally a, a girl that I know is in the Philippines working in the red light district comes back for Christmas to visit her family, right? And Wait, she's – a girl you know. Wait, what's going on? <laughs> yeah <laughs> what are we doing steven <laughs> well she was a girl from my church that went to the philippines to help save these girls from sex trafficking okay that's i just wanted to clarify for the audience sure i got you i got you <laughs> i had to clear um, your name up you know to make sure to go off and do that old social media thing you know <laughs> right don't want the wrong quote card no we don't <laughs> yeah so um so she's out there working to save girls from sex trafficking and she comes home and she's sitting at my kitchen table with my wife and I, and she's instead of like resting and rejuvenating and spending time with her family, she's pitching me on why she, why she give her 50 bucks a month so she can go back. And I was like, well, that's, that's interesting. I, you know, I didn't know that these guys mostly have to self fund and have to go get their own cash. And, um, like I, I figured they had bigger corporate sponsors, right? So I asked her the question. I said, well, how much will it cost for you to go back for the next 12 months? And it was nominal. It was like 15 grand for the year. And I said, you know, I think through businesses, like you should be able to get that done, right? And then as we got into the multifamily space and we started producing a lot of passive income, it's so easy to carve out a percentage, right? An ever increasing percentage too, to just fund all these different nonprofits and philanthropies. Right. Because I mean, like the beauty is, is like, you know, you're, you're helping people. You're also saving money in taxes. You know, it's like, why not help out with a cause that you believe in? Yeah. And, and our investors like it too, right? They're making a real solid return on investment with their capital that's with us, but they're also making an impact in the world. And most of the people that I've met that have reached some measure of success are looking to move from success to significance and they really want to help make an impact but that's a job in and of itself right like well how do i do that who do i give to how do i research these charities it's like look we got it we did it all you just give us the money like on top of your returns that we're giving you we're also carving out uh extra money for these nonprofits, and then we keep them updated monthly on our on our newsletters wow and that's really cool though um, I probably had some other questions too to dig in there too, but like this is kind of off base. But this is this this is brought up this brought up the, the interesting you know subject that you kind of dragged us into. Like what what is going on in Thailand? Like is there like a bad problem with prostitution and things like that? I mean you hear some stories, but like yeah yeah. So I mean there's just look there's <laughs> you don't have to leave the United States to find bad problems with that stuff, right? I was just meeting a client out in Vegas, and you know. There's, there's people walking the street doing all kinds of things, right? But specifically um, in the Philippines, yeah, there's a lot of girls that are kind of forced into the sex trade because they don't have any skills. There's, they're not really allowed to go to school. They don't really have any skills, but they still need to feed their kids, right? And um, so that's what this, this program does is it kind of takes these girls out of the streets, loves on them, gives them a place to, to live and to eat 
and to learn new skills. Right. And you're saying, or, and, and I just want to make sure that I corrected that. We're talking about Philippines, not Thailand. Yeah, well, the Thailand missionary that we support, right, that's the 22,000 bags of food. So through COVID, they've had a, ha- a huge um, issue getting like food around the country because like supply lines and supply chains are completely cut off. So they have, you know, really poor. I mean, poverty like we don't see here in the United States, they have really bad poverty uh, in Thailand. And these families just are literally starving to death. Right. So these 22,000 food bags will feed 22,000 families for, you know, two weeks each, you know, so. Um, and what's that? Yeah, amount? You, what's that? What's that amount that were, that would feed, you know, um, 22 families for two weeks, roughly? Like how much did it cost? Yeah. How much does it take to feed a, a family for 20, 22 families for a two weeks, roughly? Or I'm just if you well, know it was 22,000 families. Oh, 22,000. 70. OK. Yeah. It was about 75 grand. Ah, wow. That's so expensive. Well, that's a lot of people. 22,000. The VAX is cheap, though, when you think of 22,000. That's a lot. That's a lot of people. If you do 22,000 people divided by like 10 meals, I mean, it's. Right. And and so, like, these are great. These are great things, right? But, like, is there a way to, like, you know, um, make these communities more self sustained at some point? Like, what ways. Have you seen there um, as far as like innovation and in, in, in making these communities more self-sustained instead of just like, OK, now we're doing 75,000 for two weeks for 22,000 people consistently, you know, week after right. week, every, well, uh, every bi week. Right. But like, is there a way have you seen that you can invest in some type of self-sustained community to where it's like, hey, look, we put up a certain amount. Now this community is just self-sustained. You know, what self-sustained is. So, yes. Yeah. So. <clears throat> Yeah. So the caveat there is we don't, we're not just feeding that many people for that long of a time every two weeks, right? That will probably last about a year, right? That food bag is just how long that that food bag would last for, uh, for one family. But then, yeah, the groups that are on site are teaching them how to farm or teaching them how to, um, you know, just create job skills and life skills that they haven't otherwise been taught so that they can you know, move to another people group after that they're self-sustaining. Actually, I, I have a um, <clears throat> a child in Kenya that we had adopted, right, that we support, that we've been supporting for about 10 years now. And their community just graduated from the Samaritan's Purse program, which is, you know, they come in and they help, you know, dig wells and create agriculture and get people literate and get people educated and, you know, so 10 years, and then they just sent us a note. They said, hey, you know, they're graduating from our program. Uh, here's the next one that we're going to. Would you like to participate? Wow. I mean, it, it's it's interesting, Stephen, like how much just proper education can totally change an entire, you know, environment, right? I mean, you, you got to figure a lot of these communities around there were some of the most, you know, um, I don't know, most intelligent, you know, in, in, in well-read areas at the beginning of the time, a lot of these areas. But now you see a lot of other pockets where it's just like it never got there. And then time has just passed by. And there's just like so much stuff has happened that it hasn't gotten yeah. to a lot of generations. And so it just pushes out when you have this lack of knowledge, just this, this poverty. Yeah, man, that's it. And these indigenous people groups are so far removed from society too, right? Like they're not in major city hubs, right? They're like indigenous people groups that have to walk like, you know, this one, this one area in, um, in Africa, you know, they were walking four miles each way for clean water. Wow. You know, like they don't, they don't, they're not just jumping in the car and going to Wawa and grabbing a case of water, right? They're like, they have to walk with water on their heads four miles each way. It takes half a day. Yeah, I mean, I guess what I'm saying, like, you know, you see areas that are close to those areas and regions, you know, previously in the past where they were highly where they were highly civilized areas. Right. Places like um, in, like near uh, Egypt, you know, Ethiopia and things like that. And it's just like, you know, those those places were at one time kind of like the center of, of, everything, of everything in general. But now they just like kind of like haven't that, that knowledge and stuff hasn't like spread out to most of the communities or in general the whole society it just kind of like just disappeared and just like feels like everything just flattened out and everybody started all over again yeah they migrated to different places i mean it's a big world right And there's a lot of people around the world so you know it's uh yeah i mean like 
you know, Egypt is still Egypt. Like Cairo is still one of the big booming cities, right? But like when you get a little bit further, and Africa is huge. I mean, I've been to Africa and, you know, it took eight hours to drive from like the airport to where we were going. So it, it's just reaching, I think, you know, people groups that are not close to those areas that don't have the education that live in extreme poverty or war and torn nations, right? I mean, we just got done um, Afghanistan, right? We just, we helped fund three planes of refugees that were fleeing uh, the new government there, right? So we have uh, a nonprofit that we support that is run by ex special forces guys. And they got some planes on the ground there and they, we diverted what we were paying for like a couple of wells to that, you know, to that mission because it was like, you know, changing erratically in, in the moment. Right. But there's also people's lives on the line because if they stayed, they're going to die. So, and a lot of people, yeah, man, like I said, no shortage of, but a lot of people actually, sorry, but yeah. a lot of people actually, you know, were left there still, no matter what, but you basically, what you did is you, yeah. you guys helped out. A little bit. No, I mean, we, the way. we got three 747s out in like, I don't know, a couple hours. That's amazing. <clears throat> you know, How so, difficult but that? It's, it still wasn't enough. Right. And that's the point, right? Is there's like, there, as business owners, right? I feel like we have a responsibility to say, hey, you know, I want to become an entrepreneur to make myself financially free. Sure. I think that's great. Right. But further than that, you, I, we felt like we had an obligation to, you know, give as much as we could away to some of these different causes in the world. Just we love people, right? We just we love humanity. I think we can do a good thing while also doing well in business. Right. Sounds like a good slogan. People first. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I get it. It makes sense. And you know, I think I think the you know any decent human would uh, appreciate that. Um, given the causes is not something easy. I mean, there are backlashes on it at some time, at some points for certain people. I mean, you look at things like Bill Gates, who's been working on a lot of these causes for years, but now we have COVID and things like that. And now that's kind of changed his trajectory. I'm like, you know, was he the good guy or the bad guy, you know? And it's, you know, I mean, uh, I don't know that, but you know, I mean, this right. is how the world is. You, you can, you can give, but it can easily twist on you as, you know, the bad guy, you know, it's, it's crazy. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> But who yeah, knows man. what he is yet. Yeah, who we'll knows? Find out. We don't know. We'll find out, and history books will write it. Um, yeah, I, I think like that's pretty cool. So another thing I wanted to ask you too is you mentioned something about starting a fund. How does one start a fund? Yeah. Um, Briefly. Reach out to an SEC attorney that starts funds. Tell them I want to start a fund. They'll walk you through it. So literally it's between five and 15,000 bucks, right? And there's some rules and regulations that you have to abide by. And that's why it's important to have an SEC attorney. Um, you know, we have great attorneys that we can refer people to. If they sign up for the investor club and just ask for referrals to start a fund, you can do that, you know, but then what, right? So it's like, hey, I started a fund, which means you're legally able to take other people's money. That's good. Now what? Right. Where are you going to find the deals? How are you going to underwrite the deals? How are you going to operate those deals? What are you going to manage day to day? How are you going to asset manage those deals? How are you going to communicate with those investors that just gave you their money? Right. Do you have investors that will give you money? So there's a lot of, you know, dominoes of questions on starting a fund. Right. But um, the SEC attorneys are, that are out there are fantastic. They'll tell you what the SEC requires and how to take people's money legally and then how to formulate what they call PPMs or private placement memorandums, where you kind of disclose all the risk to, to the investor and then let them know, okay, Hey, you can subscribe into the fund or not. Right. So like, how do you, and, and you go around, you go around basically raising capital for your fund. So it's almost like a startup in a sense where you're doing the same thing, except for you're doing it for a fund to raise or to invest in other things. Yeah. So, you know, for us anyway, it's a fund that invests in this very specific type of real estate class, right? I mean, people have funds for all kinds of stuff. Um, but for us, it's, you know, class B real estate, cash flowing, existing, this vintage, this age, this, you know, so there's a bunch of parameters that we lay out in the fund documents. And then we show people the historical data from our own deals and they can make a decision as to whether or not they think that, historic performance is a predictor of future success and they decide to invest or not. But what if you don't have any historical data? I think it'll be hard to get money, right? I mean, it's, it's hard for me 
to give anybody money with no experience. So, you know, how do you clear that hurdle, right? How do you either get experience fast or how do you, and what, you know, I think the easiest thing to do is again, get around people smarter than you that have been doing it for longer than you and say, Hey, I want a partner. And this is how I can add value. Like I have a network of people that I think I can bring money from. Would that create value for you as an operator? And then you partner with them and now you pitch their track record versus yours because yours is bleak. Right. So you're basically saying piggyback off of their success in some sense, because due to that partnership or, the, or working with them, you can actually piggyback off that success and use that for leverage for your own fund. Yeah. And it, down, it mitigates the downside risk to your investor too, right? Because your partner has 40 years experience and you have none. So yeah, I think, I think very smart people often, piggyback off of other people's success and there's no reason to reinvent the wheel <laughs> no i totally get it i mean that's that's that that's kind of how you're you're leveraging yourself through society and, and pushing yourself up through the ranks if you're more strategic sure. about it for sure so like you now you've done like these in you know these investments you know within uh real estate and where are you where are you currently based right now again florida where, where are you i'm sorry i just moved to uh south carolina oh you live in south carolina south Cadillac. Yeah. Where That's you, right. Where were you living at prior? Jersey. Jer Born and raised in Jersey. Jersey to South Carolina. What? Um, wow. Jersey to South Carolina. Why would you do that? Yeah. Tell us more. Taxes. Mmm. <laughs> taxes. Pretty simple. What's the Pay difference? Less in taxes. Keep more of your money. Right. What's the difference between South Carolina taxes versus for you uh, versus uh, Jersey? A tenth. Wow. Wow. So did you move down there and just built a house or you just brought something on there? And like, how long have you? No. So we were down in Hilton. We were down in Hilton head uh, on vacation with the family and being a real estate investor. I'm like checking out Zillow as we're driving by places. And I found a house that looked like a really good deal. We came, we saw it, we bought it, went home, sold everything, moved. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. I like that, man. You said you, you even got a little, you know, Southern swag on there when you just said that. Like, you know, word. You've been down there too long. <laughs> it's been like two months. No, uh, no. You already tried to pick it up already. <laughs> right. Sociologically speaking, that's what people do. No, it is true. I mean, I've got, a, I mean, like literally, I mean, I've lived in South Carolina before, previously before. I've also lived in Jersey. I've also lived in Connecticut and uh, also um, uh, New York as well. And, and I moved down there from, I actually literally moved there from New England down to there uh, when I was a kid for a while and then, you know, out back out to LA and then now Silicon Valley area. So yeah, I definitely know where you're at. I, I know all these parts. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You've been around. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was up in Boston for a bit too. Love Boston. Uh, for college. But yeah, I, I mean, I love it down South. It's, um, I can be outside with the kids, you know, 12 months out of the year. Right. And, in Jersey, it's like you get a four month window to be outside and the then snow. <laughs> inside. So is the weather, the weather also caused you to do that. I've noticed a lot of people move from the, the, the up north or the New England area because of the weather. And I wonder how that's going to change the political, you know, um, aspect of like the south in general, because you see a lot of people from the northern areas in um, Charlotte and things like that. Um, yeah, so Charlotte, so North Carolina is a purple state now, right? It used to be a, a red state. Georgia, same thing, red state to purple state. Um, you know, I said, and you know, not to get political, but like, you know, for me, I'm a refugee. I'm not a missionary, right? So like, I don't like the politics of where I left. I like the politics of where I'm at. But yeah, I mean, you see the great migration that's taking place and all like California, right? Ton of Californians moving into Texas. So that could happen, right? So it, it will be interesting to see where the chips uh, fall when it's all said and done. But you're seeing some insane migratory patterns taking place right now. And it's interesting to me if people don't recognize that the reason that they're leaving is because they're voting for policies that they don't agree with and then continue to vote for those policies. So that is we'll interesting. See. That is interesting. That is interesting. It's it's true. But is it just because of is it all because of the policies? For example, in California, especially where I live at, um, pretty very expensive. But most people, I feel like they they have moved because mostly I would say probably property taxes. You know, um, property taxes and housing. You know, when you property can, taxes are a hundred percent because of policy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very very fair. That's true. But I right. think like that's the one thing that's probably the most significant thing of reason why they mostly move. 
not the others, right? That, that is like the main piece. People would rather save money. Yeah, they're just intrinsically tied, though. So your rich friends who are super liberal want to be rich, but in a conservative state so they could pay less taxes because of fiscal conservatism. So it just doesn't make sense. I mean, it, it, from a just purely logical perspective, right? It's like if you're if you're fleeing California, you're fleeing New York, uh, New York, New Jersey, California are the most left states in the country every single year. And by left, I don't mean policy wise, although that is true too. I mean, people that are leaving the state and the exit polls are all pretty much the same, right? Like, why are you leaving? Property taxes are insane. Well, your property taxes are insane because policies that fund more things socially increase taxes. The government doesn't make money. Their form of income is taxes. So if you want the government to be more involved in your life and to pay for more things, taxes are going to go up. It's just I think there's not a lot of logic when it comes to thinking about it. I think it's a, a very like, I want this, so I'm going to go do this. But there's not really the second layer of thought process to it as to how are those things intrinsically connected. Right. Totally. I, I totally agree with you. I totally understand it. But I think like a lot of people, what they end up doing is they end up, you know, adding up a bunch of different things that are variant to them. Um, meaning like, oh, socially, do I believe like if I if I vote this way? this 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 type of personality and attitude comes along with it and vice versa and etc so some people just hang on to those things instead of thinking about the yeah. financial impact of their lives and things like that but then some people sure. just you know i think those are just trade-offs where people just kind of like okay do i want this but I, I lose this do i want this? yeah you gotta dial it in right there's a you gotta figure out like by twisting the two dials what is most important what's interesting about that is if you take people and you ask them what they think is most important like there's a core value set of things that are connected, right? So, so like you can find out very quickly what people believe by asking them that question. Like, well, why would you be comfortable living there, right? I mean, in three sentences or three questions, you broke down why we moved. Well, why did you move? Weather? Not really weather. The weather's great, by the way. <laughs> right? I love being able to go to the beach in November. Like that's cool. But those mosquitoes but, are hell. Um, go ahead. <laughs> What's that? But those mosquitoes are hell. <laughs> oh, yeah. They're no joke. They're like 747s. And fire ants. <laughs> yeah, right? The fire ants. I know. I'm like spraying my front yard constantly. We don't have those in Jersey. Kids. <laughs> no. No, we don't. But that being said, I just, uh, you know, I just went out to the beach and there's uh, baby sea turtles hatching and running towards the ocean, right? I don't have that in Jersey either. That's pretty yeah. cool to watch. I've never even seen that, and I lived there for a little while too. So, I oh, it's cool, that. man. Like, Hilton Head has a bunch of that stuff. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. cool. But, yeah, I mean, why people migrate, and then it's how does that intertwine into the conversation of investing, right? right? Like, so where do you invest? Well, not New York, New Jersey, California. Red states, places that are tenant friendly and where people are moving to, right? So, I mean, Florida and Texas are taking in the most people per capita right now. So Dallas is the like number one growth city in the past five years. Orlando's number three. Daytona Beach is even number seven. Like, so we just look demographically, where do we want to buy? Where are real estate values going to continue to go? Where are people going to create more of a uh, disparity between housing and people moving there? And that way rental rates will go up and new construction will have to get built. So it's where do people go? And that's where we invest. And you think where now? I mean, we're heavy in Dallas. We're, we're heavy in Texas and Florida. Wow. Why not move to Texas, in, you know, or Florida instead of South Carolina? I don't know, man. Have you, You've been down to Hilton Head area. It's beautiful down there. It is. I it just is. fell in love. I fell in love with the live oaks and like the Spanish moss. Mm -hmm, I mm -hmm. thought that was super cool. So, and I like, we're, we're, you know, we like smaller cities. So like Savannah's 25 miles away. Hilton Head's five miles away. And it's not a real big town. So... I, I worked in New York for a while. I've lived in Boston. I've done the city thing. Now with little kids, it's like, let's just live on a nice cul-de-sac where they can ride their bikes and you know, chill out. Yeah, I totally get it. I mean, it's it's more of like it's more laid back. Definitely in the, in, in the South area, it's definitely more laid back. You get more bang for yeah. your buck, as they say. Um, and if you've ever been to Dallas Airport, that's enough of a reason for me not to move to Texas. <laughs> <laughs> I spend some time in airports. I have to go fly around and see our projects. So like, you know, when I get to a major hub, like Charlotte, Atlanta, Dallas, even Houston, it's like, 
this is, I mean, I walked for 30 minutes to make a connecting flight the other day. It, fly out of Savannah, it's like 12 gates. I, I parked out front. I like left the car running and walked inside and got on my plane in like five minutes. It was nice, yeah. <laughs> nice, easy to fly out of. <laughs> yeah. So you got a boat and everything down there yet? Or like what's your, what's your, what's your pastime? No, we don't. Um, well, I have an eight-year-old, four-year-old, and a two-year-old, so there's not a lot of pastimes. Um, but like I did play a golf tournament yesterday. And we'd like to go just walk around the beach and, you know, do, do the family stuff, you know, hiking. And, uh, it's, it's just nice to be able to be outside more. Um, but yeah, it's, it's you know, typical family stuff, go for bike rides and like, you know, just try to keep the kids alive. And, you know. Yeah. Wow. You, you got to do it, man. So, yeah, I mean, so now you've, you, you've, you've moved towards the Southeast region. Um, you've got, you know, your kids and everybody relocated. What about the family? So my wife, you mean our families, right? Yeah, like being our so families. far away yeah, from our yeah. families. Yeah. Um, well, so my mom lives in North Carolina and that's the extent of my family. Mm -hmm. My wife is the youngest of seven. My son is the 31st grandbaby on that side of the family. Mm -hmm. And outside of one, everybody still lives in Jersey. So that was difficult, but here's my justification. Ready? Let's do it. For what I'm saving in property taxes, I can fly my wife and kids home every two weeks and still save money. So my wife goes and visits her family quite a bit since we've been down here. But here's another great thing about living down here is they keep coming to visit us because we were able to buy a little bit bigger of a house with a guest room and the weather. They're going to escape it during the wintertime and come see us. So um, We'll, we'll make it work. I mean, family's of utmost importance to us, and that was probably the biggest hurdle that we had to clear to decide to move. But so far, so good. Yeah, I mean, there's also the things like what I've heard the complaints is I feel like not every person is, is, is uh, open to move towards the southeast. You know, there's uh, claims of, you know, oh, it's boring, which I can conclude. It can be very boring um, and, unless you want to do like some things that, you know, people might figure aren't that boring, right? You can make it fun, you know, but there's a lot of people, oh, it's yeah. boring down there. What am I going to do? It's just a small little town and it's just like, what are you going to do? Where, what, what about all these other amenities that they're so used to? I hear that a lot in right. California for sure. But like you get like this, these pros and cons. I'm, I'm paying, you know, I get more bang for my buck when it comes to land and property and things like that. It's more peaceful. Um, I have, you know you know, I'm not so close to an actual another uh, house or, or building or whatever it may be next to you. Everything's not so enclosed. It's a little bit more space. You can breathe. But at yeah. the same time, there's some other things that you, you do lose. And it's, you know, I think it goes back to what you said too. What's more important to you at a certain value? And then leaving all your friends and, you know, the people that you live near, you know, now you're moving down to South Carolina. They're all that you've kind of been living with around for years, they're not able to just like just up and go. And like, there's this routine that happens after years. You just change it all up. You know, how does that work? Yeah, it's just, I mean, it's a stick in the spokes. It's a change. It changes everything. Right. But I think it depends on your station in life. Right. Like I have a young family. Most of my time is spent with them anyway. Right. Like family and friends, like, we probably see family and friends more now that we've moved because it's intentional. When, when it was, Hey, I live five minutes down the road from you and you still don't see those people for months at a clip. Right. And when you do see them, it's in passing. And because they're so close, it's kind of like, well, I don't need to see them. They're right here. There's no intentionality behind it for us. Now it's like, come down, make plans, stay with us for a week. I'll come up. We're, we just went to my niece's wedding up there. We stayed for a whole week and we got to see everybody for at least a full day, each, you know, family member. And, um, you know, so I think it is your station in life. Like when I was young and single before I was married with kids, like I wanted that city life amenity rich. Like I want things to do. I want to be out until two in the morning, and like go have fun. Now, look, I wake up at five 30 in the morning. I'm in bed by 10 o'clock. Like I, if the bars don't stay open past 11 here, which they don't, by the way, I don't care, <laughs> you know, but I'm still 25 minutes to Savannah. So my wife and I want to get a date night out and like go to a little city. Savannah is a great little city. So, you know, it's really the, the balance and like, you know, where my business partner moved to, he just bought 52 acres in North Carolina. Like he's out there. It takes him 30 minutes, to, like 15 minutes to get to a grocery store. For me, I can take my golf cart to the grocery store. Like it's, it's, Hilton Head, like the whole way to Hilton Head is, is built up, even though it's a smaller town, it has everything that 
I had in Jersey. Yeah, too. I mean, a lot of people who moved to Hilton Head love Hilton Head, and a lot of people that love Charleston love Charleston, you know? Yeah, so I haven't been to Charleston yet, but I hear that's a real fun city. Yeah, and I'm about people, 90 minutes away from it. A lot of people love Chucktown. I think that's probably the most popular area in South Carolina that people can vouch for overall. I mean, yeah. Columbia, South Carolina, it's it's here and there. It's nothing to shout about. Um, right. You know, you've got – other than that, there's the other places around it nobody cares about. I mean, predominantly, right? There's Greenville. It's hit or miss. Um, yeah. You know, Rock Hill, it's hit or miss. And, then you, you know, other than that, the only biggest attraction I would say that most people talk about is definitely Charleston. Definitely Charleston. Yep. Yeah. Hilton Head is one, too, as well. Myrtle Beach is – it's here or there it used to be a, right. a great attraction but now it's just like talked out about so i don't know it's interesting yeah, it's like the jersey shore where it had potential to be great right and meh yeah it used to be one of the best beaches in you know the, in the united states or you know or the world i think at one period of time which is crazy because like I saw it on the show a long time i was like what that place no way but, right yeah i don't think anymore yeah, though true. but yeah it was cool so yeah i mean Back to your investments right now. So you said you have these these courses and things like that. You set up this club. Or, excuse me. How did you go from doing that and finding the time to start up this whole investment club? Well, so the investment club is really just an education piece for the investor, right? I think there's a lot of information out there. I think the number one reason that, I mean, we like to educate people is because a lot of people don't know that they can invest directly into these types of assets, right? Like I don't. When I bring it up to people for the first time, they don't typically know that they can be a partial owner of a $50 million project by knowing the right people. And when you start to have that conversation, right, I think people intrinsically or inherently know and trust real estate. They, they understand it more than the stock market. And the stock market is extremely volatile, but you know there's trillions of dollars of people's retirement accounts in the stock market. My dad passed away seven years ago. He rode the market down during the crash and then didn't live long enough to ride it back up. So what happens? Your wealth is decimated. That's it. You can get the past that generational wealth down because you've lost it, right? It's a game of musical chairs is how I felt about it. So Wait. how do we figure out how to insulate ourselves from that game of musical chairs? And it was real estate. And you know, part of getting people to know, like, and trust us is the podcast, the YouTube channel, like signing up for these investor club things so they can jump on calls with us and ask questions and meet the team and ask the YouTube channel, like signing up for the really understand. Cause like in a REIT on wall street, you don't know who to talk to at that REIT, right? They're invested in a bunch of different things. And you have an investment advisor that's not even in contact with the REIT that you're invested with. Like with us, you know us, like our investors, like we have a 92% reinvestment rate when we give money back to people. So, you know, it's, um, it's an important thing to educate the investor because educated investors make wise decisions, right? So the investor club was just a vehicle to do that, to get people to really understand more and then give them newsletters and content and things around even what we learned from going from the single family space to the, to the multifamily space. Wow. Give them back. Give him back people first. Yeah. I mean, it's really just trying to, you know, people don't know what they don't know, right? Like I didn't know that I could pay less than taxes. I didn't know that I could create generational wealth. I could, I didn't know that, you know, these types of things were available. I was always taught to go to school. Right. And wait, you said you were always me, taught for the wealthiest people. Oh, hold on, sorry. You said you were always taught what? To go to school, get a good job, and invest in my 401k. Ah, right? okay. I think most Americans are. They're taught to go to school, get a good job, work hard, save your money, and then put it into your retirement account and give it to somebody else to manage. The wealthiest people I know don't do that. Right? So, you know, if wealth creation and wealth preservation and passing on generational wealth is important to you, then I think you should be in control of that. Right? But a lot of people don't know how to be in control of that. You know, and real estate syndications are a way to do that. So, I mean, do you think real estate investments is here to stay for the future? You know, I mean, like we've got a lot of things happening these days. I mean, a lot of things are becoming not, you know, um, very uh, lucrative that are non-tangible. For example, you have, you know, uh, NFTs and things like that, right? And you have uh, Bitcoin, you know, the whole 
you know, cryptocurrency thing that people are riding on. You know, you have Facebook that doesn't own any actual houses or any networks. It's all digital, you know, but it's like, what do you think that is? And now with jobs, a lot of people are going remote. Yeah. So that's why you have to choose your asset classes very carefully, right? So like we do multifamily apartment buildings. People always need a place to live. Um, we do self storage facilities because people always need a place to store their crap because we're a nation of hoarders. Um, you know, but I think that look, could crypto make you wealthy? Sure. I know quite a few crypto millionaires actually. And like, that's cool. But I feel like a lot of people get into that game because they think it's a get rich quick scheme, right? Or it's going to help them get rich faster than they otherwise would. If you want to get rich fast, real estate is probably not for you. But if you want to make wealth over long term, then, you know, real estate is here to stay. It's not going to go anywhere. There's just massive shortage, how, uh, massive shortage in housing across the United States. And there's more and more people that need a place to live. And we have two generations, the baby boomers and the millennials that are renting at a higher per capita than ever before. Right. So you have the two largest population groups walking the earth as the largest rental groups anywhere on earth. So I think it's here to stay. I think there's other ways to make money. Sure. I think people should diversify their portfolios. I have a little bit in crypto. I think it's gambling, but if it hits fun, you know, like, but I think a diversified portfolio is, um, is a good thing. And I think real estate. So yeah, I think long-term it's gonna be sustainable. What is difficult in real estate right now is finding deals that cash flow. Right. Because there's a lot of money waiting in the wings. And if you just want to look at statistically, why do I think that's going to happen? Like 90 percent of the bank's wealth in the world is in real estate. Right. So those guys are pretty smart. They know what they're doing. They all know all the towers in central, you know, in the center of all these cities. And they have and I'm talking commercial real estate. I'm not even talking about the residential market. Right. I'm talking about like multifamily apartment complexes. Fannie and Freddie that have just trillions of money uh, of dollars in that and allow me to leverage it in a non recourse way, which means I don't, I have to sign on the loans, but I don't have to personally guarantee those loans. Why would Fannie Mae ever do that? Why would Chase Bank ever allow that to happen? It's because it's a strong asset class, right? It's because it's not going anywhere. So, um, yeah, I don't think it's going anywhere. I, I think a good diversified portfolio is healthy and I think you should get into other things, but I think you should have real estate in a portion of your portfolio for sure. Okay. So basically you think that it's not going anywhere because a lot of these big corporations who pretty much, you know, uh, pretty much are the backbone of a lot of the banks, you know, um, haven't slowed down. So therefore you feel like it's not going on. But you also mentioned something about millennials and baby boomers and things like that. Um, why do you think there's a decline in actually buying actual physical housing? What do you think the changes? Well, I think it's two different reasons for the two different groups of people, right? For boomers, it gives them more freedom to move around um, and not have like mortgage mortgages on them when they retire. So like, you know, for them, I think retirement is coming a little bit earlier and they are living longer and they need to figure out how to sustain their income that they've created through their 401k over time. And then for millennials, I think that they're settling down later. The average home ownership, I think, is up by like eight years from one generation to the nut, to the next with millennials. Um, they don't believe that necessarily real estate is the way that's going to build them wealth. They're getting married later. They're having kids later. And they're trying to experience the world more after college, right? So we'll see how that works out for them. I'm actually very interested to see when I'm 90, how it worked out for the millennial generation versus the boomer generation, right? Because one has an additional seven years of compounding and appreciation in real estate that the other won't have. So I, I think Forbes just wrote an article on this too, about how on average, it's going to cost the average millennial about a million dollars in retirement for not purchasing homes that that much sooner. Wow, that's large. But at the same time, you know, I mean, you don't know if that's 100% true unless you do the due diligence yourself and look at the real data and calculate all that shit. You have to look at the data, but all you have is historical data, right? None of us have a crystal ball, but the historical data is strong. This is true. This is true. The historical data, but it also depends on how you're calculating it because you can calculate things to manipulate things to be 
in your direction if you really want it to. So you really need to look at those numbers and see how it's calculated. Yeah. I mean, look, I think math is math, right? I think people that are pitching you are going to skew it one way or the other. There right? we go. So, so, I mean, I think you have to make sure that you're looking at the sources, right? And like, that's what we try to give our investors too when they sign up for the club. It's like, what's the source of this? Well, here's the stock market source from the stock market who's pitching you stocks. Here's the real estate source from the uh, real estate source that's pitching nothing, right? Like the just the data guys. And then here's it from the real estate guys that are pitching you real estate, right? So it's like, where is the data coming from? Certainly what's the, the onus behind them giving you that data and then making a decision. But I'll tell you right now, most of the people who've listening to this podcast uh, just won't do it, right? Most of the people that start real estate businesses or go invest in NFTs won't do it either, right? Because as as a species, we're lazy, right? And we're taught not to do that stuff, you know? So I, I encourage you to, and I encourage your listeners to, and I encourage my listeners to, too, because that is how you can really separate yourself from, you know, the lemmings going off the cliff. It's... uh it's knowledge, it's understanding, and it's understanding when you're getting pitched. I mean, I just told my seven-year-old this the other day. I, I pulled out a picture on a magazine, and it was um, Fidelity pitching uh, savings bonds and um, EFTs, right? And it said, like, you know, these no-fee or low-fee EFTs and savings bonds, blah, 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 you know, forged in steel or whatever, and there was, like, a big steel mill behind it. And my little girl was like, look, dad, this is super cool. I was like, that's not cool. That's a sales pitch to keep you poor your whole life. And she was like, what? <laughs> I was like, look, everything that you look at from the shampoo bottles to the NFTs to the EFTs, somebody's making money. And if that somebody's not you, you need to look at the source because everybody's pitching you constantly. You have a million inputs a day through TV and commercials and podcasts and whatever that are trying to tell you how to think for you. There's only one person that can think for you, but it takes work and you have to do that work or you can't complain. No, you're right. 100%. So basically you think, you know, NFTs, you know, these are ways to make money, but you need to really probably investigate the source. You know, sometimes it could be like a lot of people just trying to, you know, get you involved, but you might not be profiting so much. I, I guess it matters. Yeah, I mean, I, I was part personally of a rug pull. Right, where these guys they they hired these influencers, they did all this marketing, they went crazy for this. Um, it wasn't an NFT though; it was you know some 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 one coin, right? whatever kind of coin it was, right? right. And then they they raised fifty million dollars, and then they rug pulled it out, and they made fifty million bucks. And you know, I put five grand in, it, like whatever. It was a gamble. I knew that, like no big deal. But yeah, I think. I think a diversified portfolio based on real world data and analysis from your own brain space is the only way to build a portfolio healthily. Right. And my, my parents didn't even do that. Wow. Right? Yeah. It's not, it's not taught to go and do your own research. It's taught to believe the man in the suit. Don't. <laughs> Don't believe the man in the suit. That sounds like a good book title again. We got another book title. <laughs> Don't You're believe help me right suit. It? Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> Partnership. Fund it. Yeah, there we go. I don't know. I think that's a great I think I think what you're saying it, it means a lot and, it, and it's a great trajectory to think that way. Um, you know, um I, I also wonder like, you know, as we move on towards the future and technology keeps on advancing itself, you know, times 10x to 20x and etc., you know, now you can actually go, you know, to, to freaking Mars and buy, you know, you know, uh, property. You can buy property on Mars if you want to. You can go literally online. You might want to start investing earlier, get the kids involved. You know, that seems like going to be the, <laughs> yeah. the future real estate. It's cheap right now, just to let you know. Uh, <laughs> it's, on the, it's on the cheap. <laughs> it's really cheap right now. You get lots of acres there. You know, 100 years from now, it's going to be worth a lot. Just let everybody know. Um, yeah. This is I not know. investment advice, nor do I represent. <laughs> I will represent that. I will I will put my foot down on that. Get you some land in Mars, baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I, I think that's interesting. That's awesome. But this is this is a, these are the type of like, you know, future investments I feel like that are interesting. You know, asteroid mining, planet yeah. mining, you know, and you know, property on different you know uh, uh, planets. You know, like Mars is going to be one of the ones that we are, I believe, going to be uh, there for a while, and you know, and and. 
you know, settle there. I think that's going to happen eventually, no matter what. And it's like, I wonder what that does. I don't to know, man. That barometric pressure is real, real high. <laughs> you need some real strong materials to withstand it. You know, that is true. But, you know, as humans, where there's a will, there's a way. We've done a lot of things and we've said, you know, I don't know, I don't know. But as humans, we've sent, we, we, we've tend to be, you know, this, this, this resilient type of species where we've just figured it out. You know, they said rockets weren't yeah, reusable, a, but we, we figured this shit out. <laughs> yeah, there's a great book called The Future is Faster Than You Think. You should check it out if you get a chance. It's, Definitely. Uh, who's who, who's it's the writer? Just a, it's just a bunch of like real mind blowing type of technology up things. Yeah, let me see who wrote it real quick. Future. We got to got to always think about the future. Yeah, it's a billionaire who wrote it. Um, Sounds like it. Yeah, billionaire has a lot of time to think about this. <laughs> yeah, these guys are nuts. That's all they do is think. Peter Diamandis and Stephen Kotler. I don't know them. Yeah, interesting. Definitely got to check yeah. it out. So, but it's all tech driven. It's all like AI and like where, where it's going. It's cool. Yeah. So, how do people get onto your um, your club? Yeah, so if they go to integrityhg.com, the name of the company is Integrity Holdings Group, so you can just Google us. Um, and then you can sign up. We have a couple things to give away. Like we do the newsletter, which kind of gives some free like market analysis and some blogs and stuff just to kind of talk to people about why we like real estate. Um, there's a investor course there, which is like a seven day. All, all we take is your email. Like you're not going to get a phone call from us. So you just get seven days of emails to kind of run through like a seven day investor course. Or you could go all in and sign up for the investor club. And then you'll want to see deals from us and like talk to me personally get on like a call to talk about financial planning and things like that. But yeah, just head to our website. And then, you know, we have a podcast too called free from wall street, showing people how to get free from wall street. You know. Yeah, definitely. Gotta Self -explanatory. Go gotta, gotta definitely check that out. And I had a question here to ask you one too, as well Is now that you, you've got this, um, this point where you started investing in properties and, you know, management and things like that. Like how long did it take you before you actually started making some type of like profit each time when you actually invest in some of these profits to where it was noticeable in your life? Oh, I mean, <clears throat> for those that are interested in getting the, in. Yeah. yeah. The net. So, you know, so flipping for 10 years. Right. So that was kind of the foundation of like how to create um, some income, but I would say conversely, the last year in residential real estate versus my second year in commercial real estate, I tripled my net worth. Awesome. So about two years, right? Tripled my net worth because of these kind of combinations of passive income. And, but you know, when our investor, so if you're a passive investor, right, you should be getting checks from us in 90 days, depending on the project, right? And get quarterly checks on your investment that you're putting in. So you should start making money right away. If you want to be an active investor, like, and you want to start figuring out how to become a fund manager, or, you know, be the operator on these deals. Um, and assuming you find a good partner and stuff, I mean, it'll make a financial impact in your life at the rate at which you can acquire property, right? I mean, that's the caveat to that is it's not binary. It's not a number. I think most of us, I just had this conversation with my buddy, it, you know, a, a lot of us think of things as binary as if, is it, or isn't it, or how fast is it, or how slow is it, but it's not right. Life is based on a continuum on this spectrum of things. To what extent can it change your life? To what extent will it happen quickly? Right? So it, it really is very subjective. I can't give you an objective answer because it wouldn't be fair to tell people that they could do it too. I've seen people do it faster than me. I've seen people do it slower than me. So but how it's was to it what you? extent they want to work hard. How was it? How was it for you? Yeah. So for me, again, two years, you know, tripled our net worth. I mean, we were, we were making uh, a good living and then in the next two years, and it probably took us a little bit longer for it to make a real financial impact in our lives because we, the first three projects that we did were ground up construction. There's no cash flow for two years. Right. So, you know, if I had to do it again, I would have probably bought a few more cash flowing buildings in the beginning and then built some new construction. But either way, you know, we're grateful for those deals. They got us into the space, you know, and we had a great partner on that space. And, um, 
we, we just sold all, all three of our self storage facilities this month. So um, it can it can happen very quickly, assuming you have, you know, credibility with your audience, they, they know, like and trust you and you have uh, operational partners that have uh, a long term track record, then it can happen very quickly. Yeah, it's totally cool. Well, hey, Stephen, thanks for actually coming on the podcast. Um, yeah, I hope to hear yeah, more man, from you. And uh, yeah, it's amazing stuff. It's really interesting stuff about, you know, the whole investment space and the flipping housing and things like that. And I don't know how Airbnb and all these other things work into that, but definitely interesting. So I'll yeah. definitely invite you back There's on. a million ways time. to make money, right? <laughs> a gazillion ways. And that's what's hard about, you know, just yeah. figuring out what, what is that sweet spot for you. But uh, yeah, that's definitely. It, right? The riches in the niches. The riches and the niches. There you go. And again, where can people find out more about you? Yeah. So Free From Wall Street is the podcast and go to integrityhg.com. Awesome. Well, thank you, Stephen. Hang on for a second. We got to make sure it uploads. All cool. Right. Thanks, brother. Appreciate you. Likewise.